So a fully qualified flight engineer cosmonaut, fluent in Russian, and designated as a specialist on all space station systems. He has essentially done it all, and it is such an honor to have him at Microsoft, if you would. A big welcome, Colonel Chris Hatfield. For those of those who don't have a book yet, still some books for sale at the end, and Chris is going to stick around afterwards and sign some books. Great holiday gift-giving opportunity there. So uh, pick up a couple. Pick up. <laughs> so please do that. Chris is going to stick around and do that. He'll take uh, some remarks now, but we'll have time for a lot of Q&A. Again, Chris Hatfield. All right. Thanks very much for, the, uh, for taking the time for the intro and everybody for coming today. Uh, it's a delight to be here. Uh, you guys get to live and work here, but uh, for the rest of the world, this is, this is a fascinating mecca of a place and an amazing uh, uh, hub of creativity. So, so it's a thrill for me to be here. Uh, I, mostly all I want to do is have a conversation with you and see if I can um, answer any questions that you may have. But I thought maybe to start with, I'd just let you know what it's like to launch in a rocket ship. And because uh, and, I've, I've gotten to do that three times. And then, uh, then I'll open it up for questions and I'll just walk around and you can ask me questions. Do you want to hear about a shuttle launch or a Soyuz launch? <laughs> Both. Okay, uh, well, let's see. My, I, I, I'll, I'll do a shuttle launch. I'll talk about a shuttle launch today. I flew on the shuttle twice. Uh, my first flight was on the shuttle. So it's probably the most um, memorable one because it was all for the very first time. I, I flew on Atlantis back in uh, 1995. So I decided to be an astronaut when I was a kid, when, when uh, they were walking on the moon. So it, it, when you finally get to the day where you're gonna leave Earth, it, it has, it's been so long coming, and it, it has like an aura of surreality about it. You know, it's a day that, uh, one of those days where you know something special is going to happen, so you sort of remember more things than you would normally. It's just another day, but you've got kind of this weird background um, thing going on in your head. And I remember uh, waking up that morning and pulling on my clothes and thinking, when I take these socks off, I'm going to be in space. That's, <laughs> it's like this little prosaic mundane thing somehow became significant. The other side of it, though, is that if you allowed uh, the necessity to fly in space to define your emotions and your sense of self-worth, then the job would drive you crazy. Like if I said, if I never fly in space, I'm gonna consider myself a failure. Or if we don't launch on October 26th, I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be really disappointed. And, and as a result, in fact, I launched uh, 18 years ago today, is the launch I'm talking about. It was November, or was that yesterday? November 12th. Is that today? today? Yeah, 18 years ago today I launched uh, from Florida. You have to kind of defer all your emotions and just live in, in, in a perpetual state where the simulation becomes the reality. And you realize that maybe someday way in the future you might go to space, but you'd better enjoy the years that led up to it because that is really your life. And the launch, whether that happens or not, can't be whatever it is that gave you pleasure. So when you wake up on that day to go to space, you are, uh, you're in denial, you know? It's like, okay, well, I might go to space today, but you know, these socks and I may end up in orbit by bedtime, but we'll see if that really happens. The, uh, the clothes for the space shuttle are, uh, are not comfortable. They, uh, they're not supposed to be comfortable. It, it, when we uh, killed the crew on Challenger, they were essentially wearing what you're wearing. When the, uh, when the solid rocket started leaking fuel, which went in and cut into the external tank, caused the external tank to explode, which then released the shuttle from all of its mounts, the, the crew was still alive. They weren't killed by the explosion up there. Uh, they were killed because as the vehicle got separated, the, the aluminum bubble that they were in leaked. Uh, naturally, the hull was breached by the explosion, and so and they were up about 70 or 80,000 feet, and so, uh, there wasn't enough air, so within seconds they were unconscious, and they were actually killed by the impact with the ground, or the water, because uh, they, they were unconscious falling in this vehicle. Uh, so ever since then, we wore pressure suits. So that's, on the day that you're going to go to space, it's interesting, the Russians did the same thing. 
I'm getting way off topic. The Russians did the same thing. On their early Soyuz, when they built it in the late 60s, early 70s, they decided, we don't need pressure suits. A crew went up, uh, coming in through re-entry. Their first three-person crew, one of the little um, pyro valves shook loose and uh, at vehicle separation, exposed them to the vacuum, and they killed the three cosmonauts. And ever since then, the Russians have worn a pressure suit. Uh, Virgin Galactic isn't wearing pressure suits. It's interesting. <laughs> no, well, I mean, pressure suits are uncomfortable, and they're expensive, and they get in your way, and I'm not sure how Virgin Galactic, how they could build a pressure suit for every single paying customer. But it's definitely a level of risk that they're going to have to somehow answer to themselves and buy into, because uh, we made that mistake, and the Russians made that mistake, and, uh, and it's a really tempting one to make. So you put on your... Uh, Diaper, naturally, because you've got to be inside this big rubber suit for about eight hours. Um, and uh, set along underwear, then you pull this great big orange suit. We make them orange so that if during launch you had to bail out of the shuttle and you fell into the Atlantic, uh, they could find you out there, or find your body out there. <laughs> so, so, anyway. Um, and so you wear your orange suit. It's got a helmet that uh, snaps into place. And... We walk out, you get in a van, and uh, it's that, it's that, uh, that you know, big snapshot, flash, paparazzi kind of moment, walking out to the van, everybody's out there taking pictures of you. You get into this van, it drives out to the pad, and it's weird driving out to the pad on launch morning, because it's, uh, it's dark, and the, the shuttle is lit up by these huge xenon lights, and it's, they had to build it up on the high plane. Same launch pad that the Apollo's rockets launched from the Saturn V's, uh, and they built it up above the floodplain there, so it almost looks like a deliberate religious um, monument of some sort, this huge, gleaming human creation for everybody to look up at. And it's, it's doubly weird to drive out to that knowing that this thing, this human creation, is yours, and it's going to take you off the planet. It's, it's kind of, as you come around the corner and see it sitting out there, it's a uh, conversation stops in the vehicle. And you also notice that everybody else is driving away from the launch pad because <laughs> it's about three and a half million pounds of explosive sitting out there um, that you're about to go sit on. And you ride the elevator up, you crawl in on your hands and knees, which is, you know, you're wearing your triumphal suit, you're the astronaut, it's a big day in your life, and then the technician, you go through this little tiny hole and it's like, uh, like climbing into a tree fort or something. You're there and you gotta worm your way around and the vehicle's up on its rear end so you gotta climb up into your seat. Finally get yourself plunked in your seat and it's not comfortable. You're laying on all your survival gear and your uh, parachute because we were parachutes in the shuttle and all that stuff. Uh, there's another one astronaut in there who straps you in and you wear a five point harness. And we actually have an astronaut lives in the shuttle for three days before launch because there's about 500 switches in the cockpit. And uh, even if one's at a config, it, it could have you know, really serious consequences. So we call it babysitting the shuttle. And one of the astronauts been in there babysitting it on a rotational basis for three days. That person straps you in. And uh, my wife gave me a, you know, wrote a nice note, you know, honey, you know, please don't die or something like that. <laughs> and so he handed me the note and then she said, and give him this kiss. So, <laughs> so just before launch, this astronaut leans over and gives me a manly kiss on the forehead, which is very nice. And then, uh, and then that got everybody strapped in and then gets all his stuff. I actually reached over and grabbed his name tag because he hadn't flown in space yet, tore it off and because it's on Velcro, and then uh, took it to space with us uh, for thanking them. Uh, we stuck it up on the wall of the shuttle for the whole flight. And then you get ready to go. They do the pressure checks, got about two hours. You're there telling all your jokes, you're talking back and forth. I had a little nap because I figured it'd be busy later, so I wanted to be well rested for launch. And then, but you get inside closer and closer, that voice that you've been suppressing for decades starts to really get loud. That actually going to space today. Today's the day. You're going to space. It's really going to happen. And you, you let yourself start to believe it. And, and it gets louder and louder. At about uh, 30 seconds before launch, the vehicle is completely alive. Actually, three and a half minutes before launch, the engine bells go through their full gimbal. And the whole vehicle sways around like, uh, like if you ever uh, rode a howdah on top of an elephant, when the elephant sort of gets up and you feel that weird big motion, the whole sh shuttle feels like that. And 
and six seconds before launch, the, the liquids light, the three liquid engines, and they're off center. So we, we bring them up to 100%, and it's enough torque that it, it bends the whole vehicle. It's like, like leaning on the vehicle. So the whole vehicle bends way forward, right to the uh, elastic limit of the metal of the shuttle. And you feel yourself sway forward, and then the, the spring force swings you back to vertical. We call it the twang. And as soon as the twang hits vertical, the solids light, and you have seven million pounds of thrust, and you're going somewhere. <laughs> And we all really hope that both of them light. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be a very short and not a very good flight. And uh, immense amount of power. We burn fuel at 12 tons a second at liftoff. Uh, and it's a combination of the hydrogen, oxygen out of the liquid tanks, and then the, uh, the ammonium perchlorate that's in the solids. Uh, and the acceleration is unbelievable. Uh, the power of it and the shaking of it, the high, you know, in an airliner you get kind of that low frequency vibration. In the shuttle it's like a tuning fork, you're just buzzing up there and you, you're 100 miles an hour by the time you clean the, clear the tower. You go through the speed of sound straight up after 45 seconds, accelerating. And, uh, and you go through the Concorde Mach 2 and 60,000 feet in about 70 seconds, accelerating, straight up. It's amazing. After two minutes, we're at 160,000 feet in Mach 6, and uh, then the solids have done their job. They got you above the air. The solids were just an elevator to get you above the air, so then you could go fast, because you gotta go Mach 25 to stay in orbit. So the solids lift you up, Mach 6, 160,000 feet, they explode off, and all that power, you kinda get thrown forward, and then the liquids are your only source, and then it's just a steadily increasing like a hydraulic ram that's pushing in your back faster and faster and faster as you get squished heavier and heavier until you hit 3G. And it's a steady, so you know, if you're a 200 pounder, you weigh 600 pounds lying there steady for minutes. And then we actually pull the throttles back because the shuttle couldn't take more than three, uh, three and a half, but we hold 3G and uh, bring the sh throttles back. And at uh, eight minutes and 42 seconds, the throttle slammed to idle, the big turbo pump shut off, and you're weightless. <laughs> That's what a launch is like. <laughs> I really recommend them. They're a lot of fun. <laughs>